it. How the different Jewish religious leaders, the political leaders of these various stripes and colors, they've all come to trap, to discredit, to get rid of Jesus by asking him all kinds of tough and challenging questions. But Jesus was able to see through their hypocrisy. He was able to answer truthfully in a way that would satisfy all who questioned him with great wisdom. We saw how he addressed the Herodians on the issue of paying taxes to Caesar and also the Sadducees in the matter of will there be marriage in the resurrection? Will there be marriage in heaven? But in spite of their sound defeat, these religious opponents were not ready to surrender themselves to Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. Today we have another familiar group, the, the group of the Pharisees. They have come to Jesus to test Him, to see how good His Old Testament Bible knowledge is. They're asking Him, what is the greatest commandment in the law of Moses? Now, of course, as we're saying, as we all know, that is to love Yahweh our God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and strength. This commandment has become so familiar to us as Christians, we will say it and we can answer it. We, we do believe it, but we don't really take this commandment to heart. Even amongst the unbelieving world, love is such a very highly sought-after virtue. You know, as some have said, love makes the world go round. I mean, just think about it. How many of our creative arts, our dramas, the writings, the poetry, our music the shows and the movies, how many of them are centered around this idea of love as a sentimental, as an emotional, romantic experience. Yet Jesus and the Scriptures will go on to define that love is so much more and so much deeper than how the world understands love. Jesus will tell us that this is the agape love, the love, sacrificial love we are to have for God and to have for one another. That is what God requires of all who follow Him. And here's our outline for us this morning. We have the question, we have the answer. And our goal is as we take a deeper dive into what God requires of us, we would learn to love Him more, learn to love one another more as He first loved us. So here's the question. Verse 34, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? So Jesus sent the Sadducees packing home defeated. Now it's the Pharisees' turn to come up to trap Jesus, to test him with a very tough theological question. The Pharisees, after all, believed in the resurrection. They believed in an afterlife, in the supernatural. They would have applauded and agreed with Jesus and how he soundly defeated the Sadducees, who are more liberal and don't believe in the afterlife or the resurrection. Jesus had also defeated the, the, some of the Pharisees' disciples earlier when they tagged along with the Herodians to test Jesus on whether it's right to pay taxes to Caesar or not. But now we have the lead, senior, elite Pharisee. He has come to trap Jesus. We enter in the expert of the law. This would be a chief legal expert among all the Pharisees. Perhaps you could think of him as a Supreme Court justice, an expert at interpreting and applying the law. Mark also tells us that he was a scribe, a legal authority on all the manners in the law. And he probably was a cut above many of his fellow religious Jewish leaders in terms of his humility, in terms of his honesty, as we see in the Gospel of Mark. But they thought if anyone would be a match for Jesus in terms of Bible knowledge and theology, this man would have been it. The Pharisees themselves were very conservative in their practice of the law, so much so that they became legalistic and that they would create hedges or fences around the law of God. They would create human traditions and oral laws around the law of God so that they would not come even close to violating it. Now, this might be an area of wisdom that you put a fence or a hedge around the law, 
kind of like how it'd be wise to put a fence around the edge of a, a cliff, that might be a very good idea. But what ended up happening was when, the, when people were violating these hedges, these traditions of the Pharisees, that was considered sinful. And if you considered that sinful, then you functionally replace God's law with your own rules, with your own traditions. Thus, you're trying to limit, you're trying to regulate the grace of God when He has given you freedom on how to live, aside from violating these commands. Now, the Pharisees were also very scholarly. They liked to categorize, systematize, and have all kinds of academic and scholarly debate about which one of the laws were most important. By their count, they, they, they found within the book of Moses, the first five books, there were 613 laws, 365 negatives you shall not do, and a 248 positives you must do. And they would group these into different uh, categories, which ones were most important, which ones were less important. They kind of categorized things into which ones were weighty or which ones were light. Weighty ones were very serious offenses, while the lighter ones were somewhat less serious. That you could violate them with little or, or no guilt, and, you know, you could have different sacrifice for that. But it's not unlike us today. You know, we like to rank things. You ever, like, I mean, you ever go on YouTube and search, what are the top 10, I don't know, vacation destinations around me, or what are the top 10 restaurants, or whatever it is, top 10 sports heroes, or whatever. We like to categorize things. We like to rank things. Well, for the Pharisees, they ranked the commandments of God. They spent countless hours in academic scholarly discussion trying to fit these laws into different categories, and there really wasn't any unanimous consensus or agreement. But they were doing all this academic study with very little application on how do you actually obey God's law. And that's really the backdrop of this question. There would be different esteemed rabbis have different answers. You could create a big following by having the next great idea. But here Jesus is being forced to give his opinion. And likely that would be in conflict with many other esteemed and expected, uh, respected legal experts. Perhaps the Pharisees thought that they could somehow get Jesus to mess up and trap him and that he would neglect an important law and they would find a way to get people against him. But here's the question, oh teacher, rabbi, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, on the surface, that sounds like a pretty good, genuine search for wisdom. But Matthew also tells us that they were only asking this question to trap or to, to test Jesus, to discredit Him, to, to, to get Him in trouble with either the religious and political authorities or to get Him in trouble with the people that were, you know, hanging on to His every word. They knew Jesus taught a very different message than many of them. They thought they could trap him into heresy or get him to admit that somehow he was greater than Moses. After all, you know, he was being claimed to be the Messiah. The Messiah certainly had an a, opinion about the law of Moses. But that is the question. Let's look at the answer, verses 37 to 40. Now, previously, Jesus had tried to avoid the answering many of the Pharisees' questions because he knew they were trying to trap him. But here he address, answers plainly, directly, because this is such an important question to teach us, his followers. Without skipping a beat, Jesus replies, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So Jesus answers from Deuteronomy 6.5, the great Shema, the most familiar, perhaps the most quoted passage in the Hebrew Scriptures. Shema comes from the word listen or hear. In Jesus' time, every Jew would recite this section of Scripture twice a day. Now, in the context of Deuteronomy chapter 6, they were even to, to take the words as a signs on their hands and, and, and uh, put them as, uh, on their forehead. Now, even today, if you kind of live in a Jewish community or you've been around people who are Jewish, they will have little pieces of 
parchment, you know, with the writing here, Deuteronomy chapter 6 on it, they would decorate their house and put these all over their homes as a way to remind themselves of how important it is to keep God's commandments. Now, the command here is to love Yahweh your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and Mark will add strength so we can kind of interchange them and put all four of them together. Well, let's ask the question, what is love? Love is so much more than an emotion. It's so much more than warm, fuzzy, romantic feelings. Love is an act of the mind. It's an act of the will to care, to have affection for the welfare of somebody or something with the total surrender of yourself to give sacrificially to it or to him or her. This can involve strong emotions, certainly, but it is primarily a determined choice, a very strong commitment. Now, some have said love is a verb. It's not just a feeling. Loving God implies also that you would obey His commands, that you'd be willing to surrender everything you have and are to honor, to serve Him with a joyful, worshipful, thankful heart. Jesus tells us in John 14, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's love, a strong, predetermined choice, a commitment to do good, to love, to sacrifice. But what does it mean to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength? What is, this, what is Jesus saying here? I think simply it means that you are to love God with all of who you are, the entirety of your being, heart, soul, mind, and strength, your mental abilities, your physical, you know, your emotional being, all of who you are, we are to love the Lord with all our heart, our core values, our commitments, with all of our souls, our emotions, our feelings, with our mind, our thoughts, and our plans, and our strength, our physical efforts, and our might. The point being made here by Jesus is that you don't love God superficially. You don't love God on the surface or externally, kind of like how the Pharisees and the hypocrites do, but with all of who you are on the inside, love Yahweh your God, wholly with your whole heart, with all you have and all you are for your whole life. Now, in order to do this, you need to abandon some other competing loves. Whether that be love for self, whether that be love for your world, love for money, things that would threaten to divide your heart. Jesus has told us elsewhere, you cannot love both God and money, right? You will love one and hate the other. Pick one and love that one. You know, if you, if you love God, you cannot love the world at the same time. You must pick one or the other. And herein lies our greatest problem. If this is the greatest commandment, as Jesus says, and it is, would it not also be true that as we disobey this commandment, if we violate this commandment, then we're also committing the greatest sin, the greatest evil, right? That's a logical deduction, isn't it? I mean, how can we love Yahweh our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength? How do we do this 24-7 if that is what the commandment is? How can we say that we have everything that we are, we set our hearts on everything that preoccupies our soul, everything that captivates and enters our mind? How can that all be an expression of our love for God? I mean, I know what you're thinking. I'm thinking the same thing. Humanly speaking, this is a completely impossible. We're violating, we're disobeying God's commandments all the time without even thinking and knowing that we are. And disobedience to His commandments is sin. We're all guilty of it. We're all guilty of committing the greatest sin here, and the second greatest as well, showing that we have a constant need for forgiveness, a constant need for cleansing of our sin, We need salvation from the wrath of God. And what's worse is we don't even feel all that bad when we sin against this way. We don't feel really guilty when we don't love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We may feel bad in sinning in other ways, but think about it. We, we, We don't love God this way. Do you ever feel bad about it? 
Does it even, you know, afflict your conscience in any way? No, we usually don't even skip a beat. We just keep on going on with our lives. Now, why is that? Why don't we feel bad? Why don't we feel guilty for sinning against God in this way? Because we're so accustomed to our fallen sinful condition. Right? We're so used to it. The fact that Jesus has and God in His Word has to command us to love Him tells us that by default, we don't. In our fallen condition, we are selfish. We are indifferent to the love of God. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1 that as unbelievers, we were not just indifferent to God, but in fact, we were haters of God and lovers of self. We were pursuing our own desires, our own loves, our own interests, rather than God's. That's what it means to hate God, to, to, to know and even acknowledge that He is out there, He is the greatest supreme being in the universe, and say, my plans, my will, my desires are more important than yours. Now, we also find comfort when we look around us, when you see, look, none of us, not even the pastors, not even the professional Christians, you know, do we love God in this way? And we, we counsel ourselves to think, oh, we're not all that bad, it's not that bad. But we have this problem because God doesn't grade us on a curve. He's not relativistic in any way. He's an absolutist. And that means we're all in trouble. We're all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So how can we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength? How do we even do that? Well, the first thing it must begin that we need to understand is without the Holy Spirit working in our lives, loving God to any degree is completely impossible. Right, Hebrews eleven six says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's impossible to obey Him. But Jesus also tells us in Mark 9, 24, you know, in talking about salvation, but all things are possible for the one who believes, for the one who has faith in God. So that must be our starting point. In order to love God, you must be born again. You must have the Holy Spirit living in you. You must have come to Him through repentance and faith. Because after all, when we look at Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit, love is the first one. You know, this fruit, this love that we're supposed to have comes from the Spirit's work in our life. We can't just muster up enough love and enough willpower. No, this love that we're supposed to have for God, it's a supernatural product of the Holy Spirit working to change our lives as we walk in the Spirit and obey His Word. Also, we notice something else. Our ability, our capacity to love God, that grows and increases with time. See, when we're saved, when we come to become a Christian, we immediately, we are made aware of how much God loves us. We're also made aware that we have a love for Him. But as we get to know Him more through His Word, as we get to hear Him and listen to Him and see His answers to us in prayers, and just experience God's faithfulness time and time again, our love for God actually increases. It grows deeper. Just like any other human relationship that you may have, the more you get to know, the more time you spend together, the deeper your love will be. The more we see of His compassion, His mercy, and His grace, the more we see of His holiness, His righteousness, His hatred of sin, we will love Him as we pursue Him and obey His Word, and are more and more consumed with what God is, who He is, and what He wants us to be and to do. You know, practically speaking, that comes as we study his, the Word, as we pray, as we honor and seek to obey God, as we witness, as we evangelize the lost, as we serve other people. God helps us to know Him more and obey Him and grow our love for Him. Maybe it's helpful to look at some practical applications, too, to just expand, to illustrate how do we love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. If I love God with all of my heart, that would mean that I would have a greater affection for God that's growing. If I love God with all of my soul, it means that I won't just be content with these small inclinations in my being towards God, but I would recognize that I want Him and know Him and need more of Him. If I love God with all of my mind, 
then I should be mastering and knowing the Word of God so much more that my mind would be, be filled with Scripture and be fixated on, on Him instead of the many other things that have little or nothing to do with God. Because the mind here is the, the source of our mental strength and our fortitude. Right? A strong mind is what's needed to know and to love God. And unfortunately for many of us, our minds are weak. We get easily distracted. How can you stir up affections for God? Just consider the many things he's done for us. He sent Jesus Christ to die for us because he first loved us. He forgave us a great moral debt of sin. I mean, even reflect upon your own life, your own spiritual journey with God. Think about how he has carried you through all kinds of hardships and trials, how he's been with you. You know, write out a personal testimony. Think about how, what God has done in your life and meditate and reflect on what God's done for you. Also consider who God is, that he himself is altogether lovely, that he is perfect in his holiness and his power, his knowledge and control of all things. Spend time thinking and reflecting and meditating upon the attributes of God. Read, meditate on scripture, Open up other Christian books that will stir you to think about the greatness of God. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Worship the Lord in your heart and with music. Repent of sin. Sin will kill your affection for God. Develop Christian relationships where you will stir one another, provoke one another to love God more. I mean, that's the book of Hebrews chapter 10, right? We come together and don't forsake the assembling of one another at the church when we gather, but come together to stir and to broke one another up to love and to do good works. That's why we come to church to encourage and, and stir one another to love him and love others. Plug into a church more. Serve one another. Obey the second commandment. And we also need to learn from the psalmist like David. And how he loves God. I mean, just read any of the Psalms. And how they are able to explain in beautiful poetic language. How we can meditate on the glory of God. How we can trust in his power. To see that his love and fellowship with God. I mean, Psalm 119. How does the Christian love the law of God? The commandments of God? How does one love whom God loves and hate whom God hates? See, real love for God, it's intelligent, it's willful, it's emotive, it's sensitive. It's putting all my feelings and my passions and my will into action, into service. That's real faith, characterized by this kind of love for Christ. It's not just knowing the facts and agreeing and saying, yes, I agree, right? James tells us just agreeing with the facts, that's just demonic faith. The devil knows and agrees with the facts of who Jesus is, but the get devil does not love Jesus, does not serve Jesus, does not worship and honor him. Love always involves trusting and obeying. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, Jesus says. And though our obedience will never be perfect in this life, the driving motivation of a believer is that, yes, I want to love, I want to obey, I want to honor and worship Christ. Part of that obedience also is to love what God loves and hate what God hates. To hate my sin, to hate my evil, to flee from it, to rebuke and call out evil and stand for justice and righteousness. We also do this by obeying the second commandment, which we're going to see. From Leviticus 19.18, we are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Again, love is seeking the very best, the greatest good for your neighbor. This is a stinging rebuke to the Pharisees. That was their big problem. They claimed to love God with all of their, all their rules and all their traditions, but they failed to understand that God wants them to love people as an extension of their love for him. Many, many times Jesus rebukes them for having no compassion on the poor and the needy, especially among the Jews. You know, they, they would just give the people all these ridiculous man-made rules and traditions that were impossible to keep. They were burdening themselves with all their own ideas. 
they also hated the Gentiles, hated the Samaritans. They were racist. But our love for others is only made possible if we have a love for God. It's the same kind of love we're supposed to have, a, a willful, an intentional, a proactive, a sacrificial kind of love for others. Not just sentimental, not just warm, fuzzy feelings for others, but willful, proactive, and sacrificial. If you love God again, you're going to love what God loves. God loves people. You can't claim to really love the Lord if you don't love others. Maybe we should ask another question. Who's your neighbor? Right? People ask that question, who's my neighbor? Is it just the person who lives to my right and to my left and across the street from me? I, mean, I think Jesus would kind of define it this way. Your neighbor is anyone you might have contact with or interaction with. Anybody. In our context, whether that's physically or personally or whether that's virtually, anybody you have contact with is your neighbor. That's other people. So we are to love our neighbors, love people. Also need you to read carefully what Jesus is saying here. Some would suggest that there is a third commandment here to love yourself. But the whole idea of self-love runs contrary to the commandment Jesus is teaching. He's told us there are two commandments, not three here. We don't need and we don't have a commandment to love yourself. Because the scripture already assumes that we love ourselves already. In fact, we love ourselves far too much to the detriment of we don't love God and love others as, we, as much as we ought to because we have too much selfish love and that's our problem. That's our sin. The point Jesus is making here is simply to compare and contrast to say that our love for others needs to be measured by how much we love ourselves. Now, how much do we love ourselves? What does the Bible actually assume? Well, Ephesians 5.29 says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Meaning, you know, if you're hungry, you feed yourself. If you're thirsty, you get yourself a drink. If you're sick, you'll take medicine. You'll, you'll go see a doctor. If you're cold, you know, you'll clothe yourself. You'll warm yourself up. If you're tired, you'll take a nap. You'll go to bed. If you're bored, you'll get yourself entertainment. You need money, you get a job. You know, you do all these things without being told to because you love yourself. You care for yourself. But the kind of love we're supposed to have for others, you know, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us love is not self-seeking. Philippians 2, 4, speaking about Christ and his example, you know, Paul tells us, let us not look only to our own interests, but also to the interests of others. See, we all by default naturally look towards our own interests. We need to be commanded and told, look at the interests of others. Our problem is that our love is too focused on self, too absorbed on me. Now, sometimes psychologists will prescribe for you to love yourself more as a therapeutic solution to depression or other kind of mental illnesses. You know, just love yourself more. Just do more self-care. Just listen and follow your feelings and your emotions. Do what feels right and feels good. But that kind of thinking runs contrary to the teaching of Christ. It actually can't even help you fix the problems. It will make your life worse as you dig deeper and deeper trenches into selfish love instead of loving God and loving others. God's solution here is to love Him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. His solution is to think and look outward, outside yourself, not be focused on within. In order to mature as a Christian, we need to be taking our eyes off ourselves and fixate them onto Christ and to the needs of others. That's how we grow. And as we do that, we'll find supernatural joy, peace and satisfaction in God and doing His will that you won't find in self-seeking fulfillment of our own selfish desires. That's really God's plan for us, to find happiness in Him and happiness in serving others. And the only one to ever have loved his neighbor this way is Jesus. So think about Jesus, how he cared for, how he loved people, what he modeled, what he exampled, or even used that phrase that came up in the 90s, right? What would Jesus do? Care and love people. And the summary is that if on these two commandments depend or support all of the law and the prophets, all of the Old Testament, all these other rules and commandments 
fall trickle down to are responsible to, to God and to fellow man. Whether these commandments tell us how to love God or love others, every biblical commandment hangs on one or two of these commands. In one way or another, the commandments express how to love God and love people. His law is actually a tutor to teach us how to love, because sometimes we forget. And the Pharisees, they could not find fault with Jesus' answer, this law, lawyer, this scribe. They agreed with Jesus on this point, that the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In the Gospel of Mark, it tells us a little bit more of this story. It tells us the lawyer said, yes, Jesus, you are right. You're right. To love him with all of your heart and with all of your understanding, with all of your strength, to love your neighbor as yourself, it is much more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. That lawyer spoke the truth. And Jesus turned to him and replied, you are not far from the kingdom of heaven. You're not far, but you're not yet in. You need to have that right understanding, that right interpretation of the scriptures. You need that to enter into the kingdom. You need to have the right heart of what God is saying in his commands. But as we've seen, it's not enough to know. You must believe it, you must obey it, you must follow. So we've seen that we are to love God with everything we are. We show this by how we treat other people. Let me just ask you, Christian, let me ask you, brother, sister, is that the burning desire of your heart? If you search your heart of hearts, is that the burning desire to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love others? And if you search deep down within and you can say yes, well, that is the heart of someone who has been born again. That's the heart of someone who is growing in love for Christ, growing in a love for others. You know, that you do desire what God desires to increase, to abound, to, to more and more. That more of your heart, more of your mind, more of your soul, more of who you are loves Christ. To do that, you know, there are so many good resources, so many spiritual disciplines that you can put into practice that will stir your heart and affections for God. There are many sinful practices that must be repented of because that kills your affection for God. And we could speak in great length that all the manner of lazy and busy practices that can be tweaked or, or replaced that will help provoke you to love the Lord and love others. Yet some of you may answer that question. Deep down in your heart, no. I don't love God. I don't want God in His ways and my thinking. I'm perfectly content to live my own life for my own desires, for my own plans, for my own interests. But friend, if that's you, can you not see that that whole idea of self-love, that impulse is exactly what violates the first commandment, the second greatest commandment that God has given. That self-seeking desire is the, the very root of all sin. If you see that, there's great hope for you because God does love you. He loves you so much that he sent Jesus Christ in this world 2,000 years ago to die for that very sin. That you can find forgiveness. You can be born again. You can receive a completely new nature, a new life, to be spiritually awakened, to receive and reciprocate the love of God, the glory of God in Christ. If you would acknowledge that, if you would acknowledge that as selfish impulse, as sin, if you would ask Jesus to forgive you, to save you from his judgment, if you would receive him as your Lord and your Savior, you will be forgiven. You will have new life that is far better than anything you have experienced up until this point that will go on into eternity that you will spend with God. That is the offer and the promise of the gospel. So repent and believe in him and receive his love. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for how you make it so clear, black and white, what is our responsibility to you and to others. Lord God, we ask that you would forgive us of our sin, forgive us of loving ourselves far too much and loving you far too lowly and loving others less. 
And Lord, help us, convict us and, and change us that we may grow in our affections for you and our love and for other people. Help us to be able to live this way, not because of our own strength and our effort and our might, but because as we walk in obedience to your spirit will produce in us this supernatural love for you and others. Do this in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.